The Business of Cleaning, the podcast that brings cleaning industry expertise straight to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Business of Cleaning. My name is Haley Morris. I'm your podcast coordinator and host. And with me, I have two special guests from the University of Toledo. So with me, I have Maggie and I have Candace, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Okay, well, thank you. I'm Maggie Garcia. I'm the Director of Central Services at the University of Toledo. I'm Candace Huner, and I'm a Manager 3 at the University of Toledo. All right. Well, thank you, ladies, for joining us on the show today. I'm super excited to have people from my college Mm -hmm. join us um, and really to break down what what you guys are doing and the incredible efforts that you have that are making it better, not just for your uh, cleaning and the crazy covid infest environment we have right <laughs> but also um for your own staff and it sounds pretty cool so mm-hmm. um tell us starting off tell us a little bit about what things have been like for you in the recent climate so you know we've always been cleaning the the processes the same way but during covid we're more upfront i mean we had a lot of uh people who are sending us, especially vendors, this is the latest and greatest uh, electrostatic machines um, for spraying. We also had the um, ultraviolet lights that people were sending us, the bipolar ionization for air filtration systems. But when we looked at the whole process, what Candace and I figured out is that, you know, cleaning, the way we clean is a two-step process, and we still need the labor force in order to do that. We have to remove the the debris off of surfaces before we can disinfect. So we checked out all of the latest and greatest things. Um, I know we did purchase a couple of the sprayers um, only to make it very easy for staff in between classes because we never cleaned in between classes and we were asked to do that. So we did um, buy them some tools we had about 12 different machines that we have that we put around campus and the staff were able to do that. They were able to go in in between these um, different classes and spray down or um, another process that we used was a charge bucket and what that contains is the disinfectant and um, they would put microfiber cloths already folded in it and um, they'd pull out a clean cloth each time and went down and wiped down all of the high touch areas in the buildings in between um, the classes and also two times a day for our high touch point areas and even hitting the um, entranceways. And we found that very effective. Um, So we were able to do it with the budget we had And of course, you know, you didn't get an increase in budgets during that time, but um, there was funds available if we needed it. And, um, but we were able to keep the campus safe and be able to do our testing and then put that on our dashboard. And I don't know if you've ever seen the UT COVID dashboard, but on that green, we were able to stay green during that time. Oh, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I graduated um, spring of 2020, so like we all went remote during spring break and everybody's like, we're going to be back in a couple weeks. Oh, yeah. So there was a lot of preparation in between then. Yeah. You know, there was the social distancing, so furniture was removed in those classrooms. And then we also had um, a lot of uh, like sanitizer. We had to go through the process of being able to pick out a product that was not only safe for the students to use, but safe for everybody else. Um, And you wouldn't have to use PPEs. So we went with a sanitizer that you didn't need the PPEs for, and it was safe for the students. And then if you ate in the room, because sometimes students do in between classes, it it was safe on the surface. Um, So, and we did that and it worked out well. I can say I've probably eaten in a lot of places at the university I should not have eaten, so (laughs) I'm your guilty party right there. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's why we did it. We were able to pick out the products that we felt were safe um, because with our custodial staff, our disinfectants that we use, they have to wear gloves. So, you know, and we couldn't just give those products out to anybody to use. So that was really important. Yeah, Well, and that's the big thing that I'm seeing talked about more and more is how safe the products are for both like 
your staff and then whoever is going to be going through later, whoever might pick it up and use it. Um, right, right. You're correct. I mean, every product that we have, we go over it. We um, we look at how we handle it because, you know, Candace and I aren't the end user. Our staff are. Mm -hmm. So usually we go out and we have it tested. And if we find that the staff are able to use it with all the safety precautions, then we then we go, okay, it's safe for us to bring in. Um, and then we constantly go out and make sure that everything's labeled. The staff are well informed of what they're using um, because they're the end user. Um, we know they're not chemists, but we want to keep them safe and um, you know healthy when they retire. So we're very careful on the products we bring into the campus. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned earlier as well, that the biggest thing is like that, that communication and with COVID, everybody kind of wants to know what you guys are doing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so how has that shifted specifically for you? Um, I think it's a process on how we clean. Um, we were looking at not uh, cross contamination. So, and we had already started the program of bringing in microfibers, um, and then we were making sure that the products that we had, everybody knew what they were, um, what the dwell time was for the products, so they could actually see that the staff were wiping things down and they weren't drying them. So the whole process of putting on a disinfectant is to make sure that you had that dwell time. And we were making sure that if, if we had an area that we had to quickly clean, that that dwell time, the numbers went down. So we had some that were 10 minutes, and then our one was less than five minutes. And that was really important. And we communicated that across campus. And we had a, um, a strategic cleaning process that we had to develop and then let put it on our website so that we let also the students, faculty, and staff know and to have them feel safe when they came back to the campus. No, that's, I mean, that's really cool to see just from um, a previous student perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I was curious because I know there's, there is a sort of pressure of, um, you've got the recognition, but now you've mm -hmm. also got everybody's opinions. Yes. So, so everyone's a cleaner, yes. <laughs> expert cleaner, yeah. you know, and what we try to do is say, yeah, we know what we do is safe. Our products are safe, um, but we also have to prove that, you know, the surface that we cleaned is safe. So we um, looked at a different kinds of testing products because normally we would do a site test. So Candace would go out, she'll do a site test, and we use the APA numbers from uh, five to one, you know, is it clean? But this was all visually. So, you know, when you go into a room visually, you can say, all right, it looks nice, tidy, neat. Oh, it looks clean, but is the surface is really clean. Um, so then we decided to bring in a different testing product. We use the ATP and then Candace went out every week and she did random testing in different buildings on different surfaces. And I think we were doing, how many tests were you doing a month? About a hundred? More than a hundred. More yeah. than a hundred every yeah. month. And we set a limit. So what we did is we looked at what the hospitals were doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the hospitals and patient rooms, it's very important that you test, mm -hmm. especially if it's near a patient. So we were looking at what their numbers were because we had to set uh, what was a fail what was a caution and what where we had to do a retesting or a retraining. We called it a retraining process because really in our industry, you never want to fail. You never want to say that you failed on a surface cleaning, you know, because we have our students and faculty and staff that we have to care for. Um, so we set, when we first went out, we set our 50 as our, our number, our lowest number and 100 would be okay, we got to go back in and re retest. And what were you finding, Candace, with our testing? We were 50 or below. We were 50 below. Yeah. It, it was um, neat. With the custodians, it was like a competition to get a zero um, mm -hmm. on us. It, it, it was, it was kind of neat to see them um, really clean. It was a whole process of cleaning and then disinfecting. Right. So it sounds like it was positively received by your team too. Well, yes, because yeah. before it was us just telling them, oh, you cleaned the surface, you did a great job, yeah. you know, and there's verification <laughs> of what they cleaned that 
that verified it's clean. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. When you add numbers to it too, it, it ignites that competitive feeling within yeah. people. Like mm -hmm. even if it's just against themselves, like how low can I get that number? Yeah. Yeah, Candace, come look at, come, come test this. I, I know it's a zero, you know, it was just fun. It yeah. was a fun yeah. time, to, um, it, you know, in, in all the chaos with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. it, it was neat. Yeah, and it gave them um, gratification. It was, mm -hmm. it was a way for us to applaud them and say, you guys are doing an awesome job. They did we're, do an awesome Yeah, job. they were doing a great job. We were, you know, anybody who hit that caution mark where it was going above 50, we were, Candace went back in and retrained. So it was a it was a great process and it was a learning tool that we're going to keep going because the staff, it was proof that our staff know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's just really cool. And it's cool because you brought it in and it wasn't like, oh my gosh, we have so much work to do. It was, oh no, we're, we're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. How right. can we continue to make it better? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, you know, on those numbers that were really, really low, we actually went out and said, Candace, you know what, let's go look at to see the process. Let's go see what this uh, custodian's doing that's making these numbers so low. And we learned a lot from our custodians. We did. I mean, some of them had some great techniques and they were proving to us, look, I just used this product and I was able to get a zero. And we were going, wow. So, I mean, it's never too late to learn. And our staff were teaching us a lot during this period. They, they felt important. You know, like when you're a custodian, you're, you know, it, people, you think people look down on you and that, but we're on the front and we really made a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just did a, uh, a scholarship that we're, we'll be picking for shortly. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions, what, well, the couple of them centered around the importance of the custodial worker mm -hmm. and why you should treat them the same as the CEO and, mm -hmm. you know, why you should make sure you, that that respect is there and it's important. It was really cool to read through the different responses. Oh, wow. So, that is, yeah. yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was cool. So, I mean, it's just awesome to see that, uh, especially now, because we've, we've used this prompt for the last couple of years, mm -hmm. but... Um, no, I don't think I remember any of them talking about it with COVID, mm -hmm. which you, you know, you don't want, it's good that their validation is there, but you don't want it to disappear with the situation. Correct. And Correct. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. these, uh, you know, some of them were just kids coming out of high school and some of them are in college currently, but to see that their um, validation for civilians predated that, predated mm -hmm. all this mm -hmm. chaos and they had their own personal reasons mm -hmm. why, you know, you guys' teams are important. Right. And it's really cool to see when you can provide that recognition, make sure they they know that too. Right. So. Right. I know, um, well, prior to going to the uh, University of Toledo, I worked up at the U of M. And what they would do is hire um, students, uh, temporary students, uh, to work in the summertime in housing. And my kids used to work, you know, there. And then what they found out is when they went to college, they were telling everyone, hey, your best friend in the dorms is a custodian. Mm -hmm. And we even tell people that. We tell the RAs when we're doing our presentation, your best friend in the building that knows every space and knows where everything is at is the custodian. Um, the one year Candace and I did a campaign that says, ask me. So it was, um, we bought purchase these buttons and we're like yeah go up to the staff they're the ones and we told them when the students are here if you see someone who looks like they don't know where they're going first year students you know on campus um go up to them and if if not only uh take them you know give them directions but walk with them directly to the classroom show them where it's at and and you know be out there in the forefront and that was not only for our custodial staff, but I mean, to them to do, but we also uh, promoted that within our maintenance. And, you know, we got great responses from that. Oh, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I told you, it was a custodian from my elementary school that taught me how to shoot hoops in basketball class because yeah. the, the gym teacher was too busy to pay attention to me. Yeah. You know, like, um, he was paying attention to the kid that always hurt himself. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But like still, like he 
came over and I remember like I was standing by myself mm -hmm. and he taught me how to you know how to stand on the free throw line mm -hmm. and the wrist movements and everything and mm -hmm. just the really basic stuff but he stood there until I was comfortable and every time I go to shoot a hoop now no matter how old I get mm -hmm. I remember that moment yeah so yeah. and we have custodians like that um we have a custodian in North Engineering um his name is Brian Franklin and um I had a conversation with him one time and he's saying, you know what, Maggie, I love working in this building. He says, I love listening to the students. I love seeing them come and go. And he goes, and the conversations and the innovation and um, listening to them. He goes, this makes my job worthwhile. Um, we have another custodian who's Jeanette Lake. She's 82. Um, and um, I'm like, Jeanette, when are you going to retire? She's like, Maggie, these are my children. Mm. I love coming here. She said, I love the students. I don't mind. She said, this is what gets me up every day in the morning. So when you hear stories like that, I, I mean, I'm proud of them. I'm happy because they embrace, not only do they love their job, they love where they work. And that's really important for us mm. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did, listening to you, it's incredible because the team dynamic and just like the culture that you that you're cultivating and that you're working with mm -hmm. is incredible. I mean, you don't see that in most workplaces um, across the countries where your staff genuinely loves to come in. They love right. the people they interact with. And um, so that's hugely important because, you know, right. it right. does they're, they're well, pre COVID. And I'm sure even now there's a little idea like you know, people feel they're too good for cleaning or right, things right. like that. Well, what we're finding um, is that, you know, with unemployment rates when they're really high, we get individuals who come in who never thought, I mean, come on, did you ever think that I want to grow up to be a custodian? I mean, nobody ever thinks that. Even when I was working part time, um, I was a custodian and I'm going to school and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get a degree. And then I'm going to become this person that, you know, this is my dream job. And then I end up staying in the custodial service. But what I found is that what we do is really important and I find gratification in it. And um, what we find with our custodial staff, those individuals who leave us, they are leaving for bigger and better things. And we are happy when they tell us, hey, I got this job over in here and we, you know, we applaud them. You, so that lost is someone else's gain. It was like we, they came in, entry level job. They did everything they can. Um, they came to work, they were consistent. Um, so to me, that's an employable person. That's a person that says, hey, I'm, I want a job and I'm gonna come to work every day. And I always let them know we're more than willing to give them any recommendations that they need to get where they wanna go. I mean, if that's what they want to do, then we're happy for them. No, that's, it's super cool. Like, mm -hmm. I'm happy for your team and I'm glad like they have people like you to, to support them as well. Mm -hmm. But also it just sounds like you have a great team. Um, we do, we, we really do. do. I mean, overall, we do have some dedicated people. I mean, Candace, um, how many pins did you give out for 30 years? of service, I mean, that's a lot of dedication for a person, you know, and they don't realize it, but, you know, their contributions that they made for the university, we've gotten teachers, engineers, um, you know, some come back as professors, but they were all part of that educational process and they should be very proud of themselves for that. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So with everything that you're doing and obviously there's been changes mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. how how is that going how do you instigate and create change with your team to make sure that you don't disrupt such a positive culture well what happens every year as you know being in higher education we are funded by the state and so we always have setbacks and a lot of it's due to budgeting um, it's very difficult when you have a department as large as ours and we're mainly dependent on uh, manual labor. You know, our funding that we get, we have very little that goes to the materials and uh, supplies that it takes to do our job. The majority of that is our labor force. Um, so what we try to do is when we're designing and scheduling jobs is try to build in these safeguards 
Like we know what we can do if we're giving the correct manpower. And then we know what we can't do. And um, we base, so rather than saying, oh, we're gonna increase what our staff do for the seven hours, we have to adjust what we provide as services. Um, we were able, when I first got here, to come in and do, you know, you, every office had their trash picked up every day, you know. Um, that was nice. But when budget cuts come, you know, rather than put the work on the custodians, we take some of that work off and we said, okay, now we're going to limit the times we come into your office to pick up your trash. Um, and then we let people know if you have lunch or if you had, you know, if, you're, if you find that your trash is getting overflowing, um, we have central locations that you can take the trash to and that's picked up every day. But, you know, we could no longer provide those kinds of services. So that's what we try to do. We, you know, as much as possible, we try to look at what kind of services we provide. And we set those schedules up so that we can accommodate, you know, we're going to take away the office cleaning. It's not going to be every day or coming in. You're, we're going to do it to once a week, you know. And, um, but that's what we have to do because we still need that labor force. And we still need them to be able to do their jobs and do it effectively. Mm -hmm. You're instigating some other changes, though, that you told me about earlier as far as when you clean. You talked right. about um, you clean in between classes. Now. Right. So we so during COVID, we did clean in between those classes and that. Um, now that we're going back to, I don't know, can you say it's a new norm? <laughs> I would okay. say so, yeah. Yeah, so now that we're shifting gears, um, we did put into our, uh, we were gonna make changes anyways. Um, mm -hmm. Here's what I find. Our custodians should be up front. You know, we, we, we should have been there all along. And what we did is we developed schedules to where you see the staff out there. Um, we did classroom, we now do classroom cleaning from early in the morning. And um, some areas that are really big, we have those classrooms cleaned at night, but it's a very few staff that do that. And then office cleaning we have done after four o'clock. Um, and, and then you still have the custodial staff there for some of the classrooms in between cleaning. We still are going to be doing the high touch point areas. We found that very effective and we're able to do that with the teams that we have. And um, so those are still going to be in place, but we shifted our gears on how we schedule things. Um, before it was the majority of our staff were working nights. We didn't have very few during the day. And, you know, we were getting a lot of emergency calls for simple cleanups. And if we had staff available, that, that seems to have calmed down now. Um, but yeah, we, we had to shift gears that way. It's crazy to think about the fact that your stuff kind of had to like hide in the evenings, come in late just because, um, well, like an outdated just tradition. Right, you right. Know? I think right. that's like the best way to put well, it. Well, it was easy, you know, no one wants to see trash yeah. being taken out during the day. It's almost like if you had a server at a restaurant, it's like you don't want to see the kitchen. You know that's where the food comes in, but you don't want to see the kitchen not, or though. where the dishes go. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I put it like that. It's yeah. like you don't want to see that part. But I think that's really important I mean, nowadays because, you know, we always have whenever students come back in the fall, it's always during the cold and flu virus, okay? Um, that, or I should say the cold and flu season. Yeah. So it's important that we, we're up front and we're, we're showing students, hey, you can be safe. And plus, we're coming up to a whole generation of students that now have been scared due to this pandemic that our other students, our older students, never really had to go through. Um, but now, you know, in order for them to feel safe, you know, we, we want to show that we're out there and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, you know, and that the parents can feel safe that you let your students go, but you, you see the custodian out disinfecting things. And that's the way it should be all along. If you go to any airport, you always see a custodial cart and you always see people out there cleaning. Mm -hmm. um, so we should be the same way. Then you feel safe traveling in that airport. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you think you go back to the kitchen metaphor, right? Right. And look at how many restaurants are putting their kitchen more on display now. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Correct. They want correct. It. People want to see how their food and where it's prepared. Like and how it's prepped and, yeah. you know, and all the safety precautions are taking place. And I think that's important for us to, um, you know, making sure that our staff are doing the right thing and letting them feel comfortable. You know, it, it's going to take a while for our staff to get used to it. Because anybody in the industry has always said, oh, no, we're supposed to be out of sight and out of mind. It's this little elfin magic, you know, people come in in the middle of the night and everything's done. You know, people don't see behind the scenes what the staff were doing. Now they're seeing uh, what they're doing because we're doing it while they're coming in. Right. We're, mm-hmm. we're there for their health and safety and people want to see us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I think I think that's a good thing, and I hope that is like that mindset is here to stay. Like the appreciation, the the um, wanting to understand. Like you're right, it's not just magic that makes right. it get done. There, there's people behind it, and you can right. be really really cool people that do it. Right. Um, yeah. So no, it's it was one of the cooler things that when we were talking, that it stuck out to me because I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like you know, it it came after I left. Right. Um, hopefully mm-hmm. I'll get to pop back into campus and see it right. more often. Yeah, but Well, yeah, because I've, you know, I've been in this industry for over 20 years and that's what I find. You know, we were always oh, at night, you know, early in the day or over here, and then you hear all these complaints. I don't think anyone did anything today. And, you know, and that's discerning for me because I'm going, oh, our staff work hard. You know, and I'm there to support them. And now they're seeing it firsthand. You know, look at, you know, they are out there disinfecting all the drinking fountains, um, all the restrooms, uh, and they're going back out there and doing it. And there's a technique to what they do. I mean, we try not to cross contaminate. They can see it. You know, we just don't push the mop or push a broom or just take out trash. You know, we're doing a two-step process. We clean and then we disinfect. And they're able to see that two-step process. Yeah. Well, and now, like, the tendency of people to fixate on really tiny little things is yeah. <laughs> strong. So yeah. you think, like, before they couldn't see you, they would only fixate on what they could see. And then once they see something that they think's out of place, mm-hmm. they fixate on it. So everything mm-hmm. must be dirty, right? Right. And now right. It, what they see is somebody working really hard. Right. And so, like, majority of people are now going to be like, oh, yeah, maybe it's not, like, perfect or my idea of perfect but Mm -hmm. I know they worked really hard and I know it's a clean space right right and we try to tell them your focus is on the surfaces so you know so we didn't get to that floor we didn't finish the whole floor but we did hit all of those surfaces those high touch point areas um you know and and they they they're able to see that I mean these are our important surfaces that we hit and that's where we try not to have that you know those are where germs are passed you know, through those um, handles, the door handles, um, push bars, uh, stair, what, the railings on the stairs, okay, notorious. If you ever go out and do some testing, you can find that. Um, and then also the drinking fountains, um, restroom fixtures. You know, we're able, we can really concentrate on all of those high touch point areas and make sure that those surfaces are really clean. Yeah, it's all the areas you don't think about when you touch them. Right. Like right. the the thing I've heard people talk about more often is uh-huh. uh, our phones because correct you don't clean your phone you wash your hands and you put your hand right back on the dirty phone. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's those high touch points that they were like an unconscious thought before like you didn't even think about oh I open the door I have to touch the handle right, right. unless mm-hmm. of course you put your hand there and somebody's left grime there right before you or something right. then, then you notice but normally <laughs> you you don't um yeah and we try to tell them like I can't change the aesthetics of a piece of furniture you know after a while it becomes worn but we can prove that that's been cleaned mm-hmm. and that's the mo- most important part and that's what our job is to do um is mostly the surfaces and making sure that they're all clean. Mm -hmm. A dry, clean surface, you know, that's what we go by, uh, doesn't have a chance to spread germs. Yep. 
I, it, one thing I've noticed too is um, my dad's guilty of this. I'm going to call him out. <laughs> <laughs> but the smell of cleaning. So people are used to like certain chemicals like bleach and they're used to when they come into a clean space, they can smell that. Right. But now mm-hmm. we're seeing like that a lot of the chemicals we use, there's less, people tend to use bleach a lot less. There's a lot Correct. more information on how these can impact our lungs and our skin and things like that, that now the chemical use overall across many different companies and even personal households has shifted and they don't generally put off odors or smells, which is Correct. good because if you smell it, you're breathing it in. Yeah. Um, but then like my dad came home because we used to have somebody who come clean our house once a month just right. because it's huge and we have a large family. It helped a lot. And he's like, well, I can't smell it. Like, I don't smell that it's clean. Right. And they, you know, we had talk, just talked about it, that yeah. like they had switched to safer uh, chemicals. And so we might not smell that smell anymore. No, you don't. What we were finding is, um, so yes, bleach was always a notorious thing. If I mean, if you see my staff always laugh at me, they go, don't mention bleach, Maggie will freak out. Um, <laughs> especially when I'm doing my trainings. And it's always because bleach you can put it on anything, but if you didn't clean that surface first, you know, you just pouring bleach on it isn't going to remove everything. Um, so I believe in you clean first, then you disinfect. And what we, I was finding when I first started with this industry is people are like, I don't, I don't smell the clean. I don't think they clean the restroom. I can't smell it. You know, all of our chemicals used to have a smell and we put that smell there for everybody so people knew we came in to clean. Um, we no longer have to do that anymore. You know, that that's just so. What we were finding is that we were making sick buildings. Um, those odors that you smell, like it, that clean smell, it was actually things that are not healthy for you. Um, so when I, whenever I'm in a building or working with staff, we remove those things. And it's only because we do have people who have allergies um, we were creating sick buildings by putting these nice smelly things inside our buildings, you know. So now we started removing those. Um, a clean, dry surface doesn't need to smell, you know. Yeah, um, and we let people know that. And we do, you know, we're, we're very um, open. We, we'll put our chemicals on our um, website to show um, safety and health has a place where all of the chemicals we use with all of their um SDS sheets are on that. Um, so they know, we know that they work and the people around us know that they work. Yeah, that clean smell that people always want. Um, that's only for home <laughs> commercials. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we don't do it in our buildings. There's just too many people in the buildings. And like you said, with the uptake in people who have allergies or asthma, we try to avoid that. We want to keep it healthy for everyone. Yeah, it's it can be an irritant, especially if you like asthma yes. and yes. you're breathing in yes. these. Yes. Um, and it's not safe for our staff because you have to realize our staff are around these chemicals every day. And um, our staff are number one. They're first. Um, we need them to be healthy to come in. So we don't want to bring in anything that's going to cause um, allergic reaction, um, cause different um if they have conditions that they're not able to come to work or after using for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So that's why we look into things like that. We don't, we don't want that. Um, And then we always let them know, all right, you're not the chemist. Okay. And we don't expect you to be a chemist, but we do expect you to be healthy and come to day, uh, come to work and use healthy products. So we're going to create, we're going to let you know how to use this product properly you know um earlier i was telling you about a product that i seen and it had a spray nozzle on it and i'm like yeah we don't use that we don't we don't put that product in a spray nozzle it's supposed to be dispensed uh differently with a flip cap you know this way it it doesn't aerate in the air and you don't breathe it in um so we look at that um safety is a big issue with us um i tell candace if you find products out there uh, we tend to toss them. We don't keep them. You know, um, we collect all those products. Um, you know, um, another thing is with uh, with bleach, when you mentioned it, uh, uh, that used to be so common. And what people didn't realize that we were creating these toxic closets because bleach 
next to another product may not work well. Um, so we try to avoid that. And um, so even in our closets um, that are throughout our buildings, we put less chemicals in them because they're near areas where all of our students and everything, you know, people are at. So we try to keep all those heavier use products, um, chemicals, all in one area where we know um, nobody has access to those. That's good. It's one of the things like people don't think about the storage of the chemicals Correct. all the time. <laughs> and I don't um, like we just have household products. Right. So but I deal with our pool and mm -hmm. pool chemicals. So I usually have muric acid and chlorine um, and maybe an algae treater mm -hmm. uh, if it's a particularly hot and humid summer just in case. Right. Um, so like I have all these chemicals and we have a small garage and it happens every year as the summer goes on all of these pool floaties miraculously start to pile up in there right <laughs> but like i still have to make sure that the chlorine's pretty easy as long as i keep it towards the outside right where it can aerate and like the bottles and the jugs are in a plastic container pretty good and closed off we have the tablets now mm -hmm. um that we switch to so the tablets are where uh you have to watch because if any moisture gets in there as soon as you open it it just yeah. So I always have to let it aerate. And so like when I'm out there, I'm like, I'm going to do the chemicals. You don't mm -hmm. go near the small garage for a mm -hmm. while. Um, then also there's the acid, uh, which I put in the bucket. It gets diluted in before it goes into the pool. Right. And so I'm like, nothing goes in with the acid. Right. And right. I've, every time I'll go over, there's a pool brusher in there or there's somebody's put something else in there. I'm like, nothing goes in with the acid. Right. Right. And, yeah. and we do the same thing because, you know, we try to be as green as possible. And unfortunately, everyone knows that disinfectants are green. You know, you can't have or it can't do its job. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that when we are using those kinds of products that we're not mixing two different products. It's like either you're going to use this product or you're going to use this product. But we try not to do where um, staff are mixing. Like I said, they're not the chemist. And we want to make sure that they say, stay healthy. So, yeah, we look into that, too. And we try to tell them, if you use this product, you can't use this other product. So, And that's really important. And that's why we go around and do our quality assurance test. And um, with Candace and the other managers, I'm like, yes, we walk into the closet. We see what the staff have. We make sure everything's labeled. We make sure that um, the color looks like it's supposed to when dispensing. You know, we have dispensing units. Um, and then we make sure that they're not using products that aren't on our safety list. Because, you know, when COVID came in, everyone was like, no, you need the bleach. You need the bleach, Clorox wipes. And, you know, I'm like, we understand that, but we can't use that product if we have these other products that we're using. You know, um, just, you know, trust us that we're trying to be safe and, you know. Um, and that's what our custodians were telling everyone too. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, our, yeah, my dad did the same thing. He's like, the bleach yeah. came out, the Lysol came out that he still had before we couldn't find any more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, bleach is good. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's in the, it's used correctly, it's, you know. But we find in our industry that we really don't need it. We have our disinfectants and our general purpose cleaners. And if you look, when we were running our test, we ran our test for our ATP. We ran it using all different methods. And we found out that as long as you're cleaning that surface, that we were still getting the, the numbers that we were looking for. I mean, we were still getting zero. And the staff were like, look, this is all I used as a general purpose cleaner. Mm -hmm. And it got the surface clean. And we go, well, because that's the first process. You have to remove everything off of there. And that was important. Yep. Well, and then um, I think people think like because it's a stronger chemical, it's going to um, be the only thing that does the job. Yeah. So, right. yeah. but you have to remember it's a it's a strong, powerful chemical. So right, and it's it's a lot of times it comes in the gallon jug, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to dilute it. And if you don't know how to do it properly, it can become very toxic, like you said. And and that's why we find. I've never seen a dispensing unit that says, okay, here, here it goes. Bleach is going to be dispensed, you know. We try to use some chemicals that are easy to dispense. Um, and it's it's just for our 
our staff is safety. Mm -hmm. Makes me think back to when I was at the University of Toledo at Kim Lab and we were dealing with highly concentrated hydrochloric acid. Yeah. And uh, my, uh, well, he wasn't technically my lab partner because this was Okim, but he had his head in the hood. Mm -hmm. Not supposed to do that. Right. Um, but he was, he was trying to look at something and like, I hate the little, the little fully like plastic clear pipettes. Yes. Um, but there's like these ones that have the red on them. And I think one of them is like really, really sensitive to touch. Like mm -hmm. you only have to squeeze a little bit and everything goes shooting out of it. And I was using one of those. So naturally, like I have my, <laughs> my pipette with my hydrochloric acid. And I like okay. barely touched it and it goes shooting across the hood. And uh, this was the last time he put his head in the hood because there's just like the sheet of um, plexiglass mm -hmm. or whatever it is between us, but it splattered against there, like all where his face was. And I was like, look at you doing stuff you shouldn't be doing. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I got so just like the lab safety, we, we, you we have, have that safety program in place for a purpose, you know, and a lot of our older staff don't understand, you know, they're, they're so used to cleaning and, but we have to be able to present our training and um, go back and retrain and show them the reason why. And I think that's really important. If we have a why factor to why we do things and we're able to give that information to our staff, it's easier for them to understand than to say, no, you're just not allowed to do that. So um, we, we give them the information that they need. And this is a reason why you need to dispense, use a dispensing unit. It's because higher concentrations of this chemical um, is only going to make your job harder. And our, our motto is you're going to work smarter, not harder, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you're using more products on something, it just takes it, it, it creates a, a cleaning problem because then you have to remove that residue from that product. And, um, and we learned that with even carpet cleaning, people always think you need a high detergent to clean a carpet. And what we try to train our staff is the more chemicals you put on that carpet, the more dirt it's attracting. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It's attracting the dirt. It's encapsulating it. And what we need to do is lift it up. So really, you just need to um, spot spray and extract. So um, don't add any more chemicals than what you need. And um, now they're, you know, they're catching on. Yeah. But, you know, it's a learning process. It, it is. It's it's just telling them why we're doing why we're changing up things, you know. It's that communication where you said staff don't like change. Um, it's like when you bring in a new product, you tell them, this is the reason why we're doing it. We're not just going to give you the product and say, uh, it's because I told you to so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and two, you've already done the research to figure out why you should be switching to this product. Correct. So you already know your why. Correct. And it's just if your, your team members are going to be the people that make it happen. Correct. It's the end user. You know, I always get a lot of vendors and we get it all the time. We get vendors who come and give us the latest and greatest thing. Um, and we look at it and um, it's almost like uh, cleaning elevators. Uh, everyone wants it to be shiny. And I had to tell my staff, they're like, hey, you took away this product. It, it made the elevator so shiny and, you know, we want it back. And I'm trying to express to them, it's an oil base. What you used to put on was oil. And what, what, what does oil do? It attracts dust and dirt. So why are you making, creating more work for yourself? You know, um, the, the stainless steel is not made to shine. That's chrome. Chrome is made to shine, not stainless steel. So it, it, it's teaching the staff about the different surfaces too. Because we do work in an environment that has all these different kinds of surfaces. And if they don't understand what they're supposed to be naturally, everyone wants everything shiny. You know, if it's shiny, it's clean. Well, some surfaces weren't made to be shiny. Um, and we have to teach them that. Mm -hmm. Well, you think of um, think your face, right? Right. And you think, like, people want this dewy look, but, like, when your face is oily, it's as shiny as it's going to be. Right. It's not clean. You know, right. it's got right. gunk build up on it. You're getting stuff trapped underneath there, stuff mm -hmm. on top of there. You mm -hmm. feel grimy and dirty. It's the same with surfaces. Right, right. So, so we try to teach them about the surfaces. Um, You know, uh, our staff are used to waxing everything. Remember when I come in, mm -hmm. I look at the floor and I'm going, wow, that's beautiful terrazzo. It's a natural stone. And yet, 
they're going, well, we have to put wax because everybody likes it shiny. And I'm going, no, it's a natural stone. You know, it's not meant to do that. And once you start doing that, you're just creating more work. Um, Cause what, you know, in our industry, we don't have a lot of manpower to do the floor care that's needed in some of these buildings. And if we have, you know, at the University of Toledo, we have some beautiful buildings that have been around for years. And we have terrazzo floors that are just gorgeous. And to me, they should be in their natural state. You know, um, they don't need to be shiny. Um, it is a stone. It's a lot of care that went into putting that down. Um, we should be buffing it and polishing it, making it look as natural as possible. Um, so, you know, and that's a learning process too. It's, I mean, the education behind like what things are, and mm -hmm. like you said, it's educating on the surface and the cleaners mm -hmm. and teaching them like, this is what you're interacting with. And this is why we should, um, not clean to appease the visual eye. Right. We don't know? clean for aesthetics. Yeah. We clean exactly. for health and safety and, you know, and that's hard to get to them, you know, and it's like, yes, that's what we're doing. Of course, I'm pretty sure if that elevator was shiny, people are going to think, wow, but really we can go back to them and say, look, that's, you know, once you start putting oil on something, you have to take it off. And then, like I said, all those vendors can come in and say, hey, we have something to make it look real shiny. And then when you try to take it off, oh, but we have this other product. That will help you get that other, you know, to make it look back to its natural state. And I'm like, leave it in the natural state. Like, you know, it's that? easier to clean. Yeah. You know, we, you know, like you said, with our workforce, our workforce isn't getting bigger. And it's happening across the nation, you know. Um, especially if you're in higher education and you're state funded, our workforce isn't going to get any bigger. So we have to be smarter on how we clean. And we have to be smarter on what we do because we can't create more work for our staff. And that's what we try not to do. We're not gonna create more work for them. So we're gonna bring in products that are simple, um, that make their job easier, and you know that they understand how to use. Um, and because we wanna keep them employed, you know, that, and we wanna keep the campus safe. No, it's good to hear it. It's good to hear like your priority isn't putting makeup or like the, yeah. you know, the, the cleaning makeup right. onto the, it's actually just making sure like, like with the skin analogy that it's, it's cared for and it's right. loved, right? Right. You know, right. that it's healthy underneath everything. Right. So. We're not going to create, you know, put heavy products on everything. It's the same when you go around and spray all this disinfectant. You know, it's nice that you spray it all on. Somebody has to take that off. Because that disinfectant is only um, affected for a certain amount of time. So we can go in and, you know, you've seen the commercials where they're spraying down the subways. They're spraying down buses. They're spraying down all this. And I'm just thinking, that's a lot of work. Because somebody has to take that off. That that disinfectant mm -hmm. isn't going to last on that surface. It makes you wonder if they somebody even goes through to take it I'm, off. I'm... I'm very hopeful. <laughs> I, I'm very optimistic. I'm going, somebody's going in. They got to show the other person going in and wiping it all down to clean it. So um, I wish they would have showed that part first and then that. So I'm I'm very optimistic. I, I know that's what they were doing. So, <laughs> But you did see all that spraying going on. And to me, that you, you still have to remove that. You got to remove all that to clean it. Um, and then you just reapply that. And that's what we do on a daily basis is we clean, put on, uh, spray down everything with disinfectant, let it have that dwell time. And then we, we do it again because like you said, it's only good for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of, we got, we go a little bit deep in there, which I really love. I love <laughs> talking about like all of the work that your teams are doing and you guys are doing to make it a better environment um, mm -hmm. and to maintain like those high standards. So with the current climate and with, you know, cause it's, there's some uncertainty right now with this new variant and things mm -hmm. like that. So what are you guys thinking kind of going forward? Are you kind of um, on like the pace you're, you know, you've got your processes and everything in place that you're going to maintain going forward? Or do you um, I feel that I feel very confident that we're able to maintain um, our, 
we, we have a cleaning method that we introduced um, when we started with our training program. Um, we were going to do it anyways because, I mean, I've only been with the university for a couple of few years, mm -hmm. um, and it'll be going on my fourth year. And what I do when I first go out is observe and see what we're doing and then try to improve on our processes. And I feel very comfortable with our training and what we started doing that we're able to maintain what we do right now. Um, like I said, we introduced the charge buckets because um, it has a disinfectant in it. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I, I was talking to you about spraying down everything like this, um, we ruin a lot of surfaces. You know, if we just start taking that spray bottle and we're just spraying everywhere, it that it disperses in the air and mm -hmm. it gets on everything. Um, so what we're doing is doing it with the charge bucket. Um, it also is tiresome for our staff. So can you imagine this is all you're doing yeah. all day? Um, so this is a, a process that is not only healthy for the students and faculty and staff, but it's healthy for our staff who we have to apply it because um, it doesn't, they're using the cloths, they pull them out of the bucket, we don't throw them back in once we use them. It has 16 folds, so we're able to touch um, with one bucket 192 surfaces. So, and it's a faster process. So, um, we introduced that. We're going to continue to do that. You can see those buckets on all of our custodials um, on their carts. We're going to continue with that process because we found it very effective. And um, we're going to keep that. That's our new method of cleaning. And they get that dual time too. Yes. Because it'll remain wet. Yes. That was a thing. We were just wiping and drying, you yeah. know, and this it'll mm -hmm. remain wet. Yeah, have you ever gone to a restaurant and they just wipe everything down and then somebody comes back and they just dry everything and you're going, ah, oh, the dwell time. <laughs> it's, just, it's just funny because like, um, I worked in a restaurant and so of course like I was our hostess so I bust the tables and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And it's thinking back to like, I mean, we just had our cleaning solution. We just sprayed it and we wiped it down and then we just went. Um, and somebody would usually come in within the next couple minutes on a busy day and be sitting down already, probably before it was dry. Yeah. Yeah. So it, <laughs> or they use the same cloth. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, yeah. The, the cloth yeah. sits on there. Like, I mean, yeah. sometimes it would be a couple of days that you're using that cloth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. It, we no. don't want, we don't like to hear stories like yeah. that. No. It's cross-contaminating like, yeah. everything. Yeah. 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 That's, we, that's the way we like to go. So we like to go with the cross-contamination. Um, and, and purchasing enough microfibers for our staff that they can switch things out. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to make sure that all the surfaces are clean. And like you said, we they wipe it down and they're able to leave that there and let it dwell. So the dwell time's working, you know. So that's, that's the way we like to go. I like, well, it's good to know that we did that part right. Yeah. Because, and like I said, we were we had a lot of high school girls that would come in and host us and our manager, mm -hmm. she'd probably done it since she was in high school. Mm -hmm. So that was her, her experience was just what she had been trained on, which right. is what she trained us on. Um, and our priority was just to keep the customer from getting mad. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And get, and keeping those tables full. So yeah. once somebody's gone, you know, that mm -hmm. time wasted. Yeah. yeah. Without overwhelming yeah. your staff. Yeah. yeah. And then yelling at the kitchen guys every so often because mm -hmm. it'd be too slow. So. Yeah. And, and very, you know, um, throughout the day, um, we have different events and things going on in the buildings. You know, we might have a day where it's real slow. Um, and or we might have a day where we're having three or four different events and there's a lot of people coming through. So we, we have to take that in mind when we're um, creating these processes because we need to make it fast and simple for our staff mm -hmm. to get through. Um, so that's why we, we look at those different products and methods of cleaning to, to work with them. Some, some of them didn't know what a dwell time you know, what's a dwell time, yeah. you know, and, and teaching them that process so they knew, you know, mm -hmm. what, what a dwell time is and that, mm -hmm. um, that is, that's helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're kind of making this, you know, 
and before I came into working with the industry for the podcast, I didn't know what any of this was. And like I said, mm-hmm. I worked in an industry where I probably should have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but now you're you're kind of working to make it common knowledge across. And this, right. This is the very same film. And then mm-hmm. we make it better. Mm-hmm. So right. it's kind of mm-hmm. interesting because that's the hope is that you can get to that point where... Yeah, everybody understands what dwell time is coming in, and you get to add to that knowledge. Right, right. Or right. what this chemical does, mm-hmm. or going through it, and what you can use this chemical for. That 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 the training is so important. With mm-hmm. That. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we've um, upped our training process, and then we're in in the process of reviewing. Because it's, I always tell the staff, you know, if they can name off, if we can give them three messages that they can take away and that stays with them. Um, That's really important. So in our training process, we try to do that, is give them three important things that you're going to learn from this first objective on how to clean surfaces or how to even mop a floor. Um, I remember uh, doing a training class where I put a smiley face on the mop, and then on the other side was a frowny face. And I used to tell the staff that you have to mop towards you So if you go turn it around and you keep seeing the frown, you're not mopping correctly because then you're swirling the dirt around. So it's a method of coming right back out to the room so that we're not pushing the dirt back on the floor. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about your team members. Mm -hmm. How big is your your team at the university? We have uh, 110 custodians underneath us, yes, on main campus. Yeah. So you, you've got a solid team. We do. Yeah. We do. And we do have a lot of really, really, really good uh, custodians. On that. Uh, I can I can say it, and I know Candace can because of our testing numbers, and, you know, and they're proud. I mean, when I walk through a building, they're like, come look at my floor. Mm-hmm. Come, look, come look and see what I did. And, you know, I'm always happy to go around and see, take my time to listen to them and see how enthusiastic they are. So it's a big labor force. Yeah. We'll have to show them the video just so they know how much you guys brag about them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they I love do. UT. They yeah. love UT. Yeah. They, I mean, yeah. that's our, yeah. we do. We love UT. Yeah. And our director is really good. Um, every year um, during the fall, he likes to give a thank you to the whole team, not only to our custodial staff. Our maintenance staff work hand in hand with us mm-hmm. because, of course, we can't do it without them. You know, um, our, our custodial staff might be the eyes and ears on campus because we actually are in a lot of the buildings. You know, we're in places that not everybody gets to go into. Um, they report campus safety to campus safety if they see strangers in the buildings. Um, so they're very good at doing that. If they see somebody that doesn't belong, um, they report that. Um, they report the damages like leaks. I mean, they, they are the first ones, you know, they're like, uh, like our uh, EMT responders, you know, they go out there and <laughs> they call us and say, hey, this is, I can hear a noise. I don't know where this is coming from, but it's coming from the maintenance room. Can you come over and unlock it? And sure enough, they've, they've caught leaks. Mm-hmm. Um, they helped uh, maintain, you know, create more damage than what it would have if it went unnoticed, but mm-hmm. They catch those things and they bring them to our attention. Um, so I'm grateful for what they do. Yeah, they're, they're good. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. All right. So I guess from you, is there anything else that you would like to talk about or about your efforts um, to like your continuous improvement efforts? I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, I, I think, um, like I said, um, the biggest challenge for us is to create um, our schedules you know, when we create our schedules, we try to make it even across the board. As you know, in the custodial uh, business, if you have, if you're taking care of one, you're maintaining one floor, it used to be, okay, this person has this floor and this person has this floor. But when you look at the cleanable square footage, the one person on the bottom might have all the classrooms, you know, and that's daily. And then another person would have offices. And so that offices were clean once a week, that made it, you know, they, they had, a, their job was a little bit smoother than the person who is below. So when Candace and I were, we were looking at all of this and I was um, going through it is 
for the space. It might look like you have a lot of space, but really we go by the task. So not only do we create schedules, we look at what tasks the staff are doing and how long does it take to do that task? Because that's really important when you're doing your scheduling. And I think that's important with anybody in our field. Um, um, I also looked at, you know, we don't have, we're not a business that has, you have, everybody comes to work 100%. Like every day I have 110 workers. Um, that doesn't happen because that's unrealistic in any industry um, because you have a lot of benefits, which include vacation time, sick time, and we have to take that into account too. So when we do our scheduling, we try to say, hey, what, what is our biggest day that we have a lot of absenteeism or that staff like to take off? And we looked at it as Friday. You know, Friday seemed to be the day that people like to take off, you know, and they have a right to. You know, they've earned that. So we create schedules to where if we do have to do detail work, we never do it on a Friday. Wait, Friday should always be your easy day. It should be doing dailies, um, those tasks that you have to do all the time, no matter what. Your deep cleaning of offices, deep cleaning of classrooms, restrooms, that should be um, Monday through Thursday. And um, I find that if people start taking that route and look at that, it's important because you're never 100% where you have everybody here. I mean, have we had a day? No. And that's the biggest mistake people make in our industry. And I see it all the time. Is they create these schedules to where everybody's here every day. We have enough staffing. We're all jolly. But that's unrealistic. We, we have great benefits for our staff at the university, you know. And um, we want them to use those benefits. You know, we don't want to take it away. They've earned it. But we also have to be realistic on how we schedule. And I find that if you create schedules like that, um, it takes that burden where if you have five people off or, you know, we're, we're so big, you might have 10 people off per day. We're able to cover those areas and do what we said we were going to do through our service level agreements. So I, I, I think that's really important for our industry. It's clever to actually look at, like, I don't think anybody, I don't think many people look that deeply at, um, when, when are we likely to get the, the most out of our teams, you know, right. like, nobody wants to work on Fridays, right. <laughs> everybody's ready for the weekend, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, holidays come around, and you know, you probably got a lot to do, but everybody's excited about the holidays, I'm sure you guys right. see. Right. And so we do, you know, when it comes to holidays, so what we do is go, okay, we know people are going to take off. We know that's when we have less people around campus because they're taking off too. So during those times, what we do is we inform all of the people on campus. We let the people on campus know that, hey, we're coming up to the holidays um, when we have limited staff. So I think that, you know, it goes back to that communication we're communicating out there to say, um, you know, we have limited staff, so we will be pulling the trash between these times. So if you do have trash in your office, and we already serviced your office, um, if you take it to the central locations, it will be picked up. But this will be the last time that trash will be picked up. So we try to communicate mm -hmm. those, you know, those things out there because we, we understand, you know, our staff take up vacation. We understand so do our uh, the other staff in the building that, you know, don't work for us. So we have that communication and that's really important. I bet I bet your teams appreciate that a lot too. Well, <laughs> yeah, well we you we try to accommodate them. And yeah. sometimes it we're not always able to, but you know, it it's just the way our business is run. Mm -hmm. huh. But no, but I, um, I would say like everybody always talks about like flexible scheduling in today's work environment that like there's this, you, I think people almost want to be able to come in when they want to come in and that's yeah. their idea of flex. But I feel like scheduling like that where it's the human aspect is being taken into consideration. Right. Right. Is, is better. Right. You know? Because like, you know, Candace and I were talking on the way here. She goes, I hear about all these companies that do all these flex times and things like that. 
And um, it would be great if our industry were able to be like that, but unfortunately, we have an operation. So even though um, you know we're not able to flex as much as we would love to do it, um, we still have an obligation to get that classroom ready so that the students can start right at seven. You know, um, we still have an obligation to clean the offices when we say we're supposed to clean them. Um, we we still have those things that we have to deal with. Um, uh, yeah, this is a, uh, it's like being on the assembly line. You just can't take a break when you want to. Yeah. You know, um, there's a reason why you have to stay on this assembly line until somebody rings that bell and you can get off. It's because everything keeps rolling. You know, nothing keeps stopping. Um, I don't want to say we're like an assembly line, but um, we just can't stop because our operations yeah. don't, don't stop. You know, it's not you. It's not the type of job where you can have like a work when you want type mentality, right. or right. Uh, where people pick their schedule type mentality because right. it doesn't. There's so many elements. There's so much that's going on. So many things that are time dependent with right. the classrooms and with class right. schedules and stuff like that. So. Yeah, we try to create the, you know, the two different shifts to say you have an opportunity to work this shift or that shift. I mean, that's as much as, you know, possible. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It just, I, think, I think it goes a lot long, a lot further than what people think. I think people think the flexible scheduling, working when they want is going to be like their ideal environment. Right. Um, people like structure. <laughs> uh, I just had a talk about this last night with somebody. People like structure. The structure will come back around. But right. having a company that takes into considerations that you, how hard you work on Monday and Tuesday is not how hard you're going to work on Friday. Correct. Um, and that, like, mentally you're already probably half cashed out. But also there's less people in the like your right. office or your right. campus that day. Right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So the work making the work actually look different to match that. Right. So you do have a day where it isn't that you have to be in every single space every day. We're just asking you to go into these common spaces, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, but we still have our staff that love to do everything every day. <laughs> and yeah. how do you scold someone that says, okay, you're not supposed to go into the offices every day, but they're my clients and I feel obligated. Oh. And we're like, we understand. But when you're absent and we a different make, custodian yeah, shows up. We can't do that. Yeah, it's yeah. different. It's like someone else who's covering ha is probably covering your space in another space. So it makes it very difficult for them. Yeah. But we appreciate all that they do. Um, and, and we have a lot of people like that. They, you know, um, we have a lot of people that love their job. And they, they, I mean, if you look at them and watch their work ethic, you're like, you take a break. I know, but I need to get this done. The yeah. students are going to be coming in, and I want them to have a great, you know, We're great time. Ownership, ownership yeah. in there. And yeah. our job is to make our freshmen, the, their first experience, great. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's our job. You come to the university, you're proud to be here. And um, that, but that's our job is to make that first impression for the students and the parents to be the greatest impression. Because if you look at statistics on why students pick where they pick, um, it's usually because of the aesthetics of the campus. Um, so that's one up for us and one down for the professors. They got to yeah. work a little bit harder. So. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, UT is very nice in that it, the buildings are gorgeous yeah. um and I, it was awesome when they renovated the basement of the business building too yes yes because <laughs> yeah. so many of us were in there i was in an organization that was our meeting space mm -hmm. um but like that was when i was picking a campus this was close to home for me right. and nobody wants to go close to home when they yeah. graduate yeah school. and i do think that you know at the university they listen to the students to know i mean because our department, it encompasses everything. Um, we, we take care of the buildings. We're the facilitators of those buildings. So um, we do hear from the students that the most important thing are their classroom settings. Look, if I'm comfortable in a room because this is my learning atmosphere, then we got to create an environment where it's easy for you to learn and not be distracted. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as a freshman who started off with 8 a.m. classes, 
four or five days a week and I went five days a week uh-huh. was much appreciated. So I don't Good. know how I did it now. Good. <laughs> I can't even make it in here at 8 a.m., let alone being at Kim class at 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. Kim and bio. Oh, I was yes. ambitious. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I know I took all those classes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, no, that mm-hmm. it's, I like I said, I love having you guys on because this was, I spent five years at this university, oh, um, okay. you know, and I was there, there was a couple of semesters where I was only there two days a week. Mm-hmm. Most of them was there four or five days a week. Mm-hmm. And when I went to campus, I'd stay on campus most of the day because, yeah. Well, we appreciate that you called and invited us. I mm-hmm. mean, this was a great opportunity for us and to help, you know, um, students who are alumni. Um, so that's great, too, um, as much as we can. So, yeah, we're, we were excited about it. And um, I feel this is a great opportunity. And I love what you're doing. So thank you. Uh, I don't think there's too many podcasts out there who talk to individuals in the different aspects of cleaning. Um, like you said, everybody wants to be an expert at cleaning. Um, my husband's a Windex uh, kind of uh, paper towel guy and, uh, that cleans everything. And I have to tell him different, but, you know, that's home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you for everything that you're doing. I mean, that's great. And um, yeah, we look forward to watching all the podcasts, too. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I'm excited um, to connect you guys and to to build the relationship that we have to get here. But um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming on because talking to you before, talking to you now, hearing about like how well you interact and run your team and the Mm -hmm. initiatives you do to make the University of Toledo that much more of a home for the students and staff, Mm -hmm. it's incredible. So Mm -hmm. I'm really glad Mm -hmm. we get to talk about that and share it and show the, you know, show Mm -hmm. everybody who's gonna listen you know okay well thank you so thank you (laughs) all right and thank you everyone for tuning in to this month's episode of the business of cleaning i say you should check out the blog post where we'll provide everybody's information and that we'll see you again next month